This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. One Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples were going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God. When Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the Passover, of the presence, which it was not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. And then he said to him, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had withered hands. They watched, they watched him to see Jesus would care, cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. And then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? And they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him. How does this to kill him? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Lord, uh, we give you thanks we give you thanks for your word and your holy scripture and how they enrich and feed us. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'll stand up here instead. So, uh, so the, reading, the reading I'm preaching on is, uh, is on Deuteronomy. And uh, so I'll preach on that. Actually, it's very odd for me to be up here. I don't like that. I'm a Nisei. I'm a Nisei. So, uh, and my children are Yonsei. So I'm third generation. San is three. Uh, so I'm third generation uh, Texan. I'm third generation American. And um, so as a Sansei, I, I, my kids are, are little, uh, they're little younger, they're, they're Yonsei, fourth generations. There, there are a few other generations uh, uh, from the Japanese-American side. I got married later, so my kids are a little bit different. They should be like fifth or sixth or anything like that. Anyway, what I've, I've told them in the last uh, couple of years, I've tried to sit them down together, which is hard. It's like herding cats. Sit them down together and talk about our past, our history, of why we're here, why, uh, uh, why my grandparents came to the United States in the early 1900s, 1904, 1905, and to talk about that because it's easy to forget. It's easy to get in your car to go to HEB. It's easy to flip a switch and the light comes on. It's easy to flush a toilet that's just few feet from us, or have a refrigerator, uh, icebox, what my dad would call it, or any of those things. It's just normal, right? That's what we have, except that's not what my grandparents had. That's not why they came over from Japan to come to the United States of America. They came looking for hope. They came looking for a life. They came looking for a place where they wouldn't have to be in servitude, right? Um, and to tell my children that, to explain to them, your grandparents came on a big boat in a port in San Francisco, and they traveled uh, across the country looking for work and eventually found themselves in the Magic Valley Rio Grande Valley, which is nothing magical at all, and farmed land that the, the Caucasian or the Hispanics did not want. They farmed 
and they farmed hard. They didn't have gasoline tractors. They used animals first, right? It, it, and they got around with horses and stuff like that. It's hard for my kids to understand that. It's hard for me to understand that. They, they're, there wasn't ice in your house because I like having my drinks very cold. Things weren't like that. Meats weren't always kept in, uh, in a nice ice box. Sometimes they were kept outside. That's just the way people grew up in the early 1900s. Thinking about the past. So in Deuteronomy, we have this reading that is what we call the Ten Commandments, right? In Deuteronomy. And you're thinking, hopefully, wait a minute, I've heard this before. In Exodus, why is there a repeat? And you may be thinking like me in a very weird, weird way with Mel Brooks, right? Mel Brooks, uh, in his little comedy, he had 15. He had 15 commandments, and he happens to slip and one breaks, right? He says, here, Israel, I have 15. I, I have ten commandments left, right? Anyway, uh, it is here in Deuteronomy that the ten commandments are repeated. And you're kind of wondering, like me, why are they repeated? Forty years has passed since Moses led them out of Egypt. God has given them the ten commandments, right? Right? And then 40 years, a new generation has approached and has come as they get closer to the promised land. As they've wandered, children have been born, a new generation. And so the Ten Commandments are repeated. Not as second-class citizens, not as a second or third generation, but as just like the first generation, they will hear God's voice. And God will tell them, you're not a third or fourth generation. You're a first generation still that belongs to me. You're not a generation that belongs to me because of your parents or your grandparents. You're a generation that belongs to me because you are. And if you put them two together, Exodus 20 in Deuteronomy 5, you'll see an expansion from Deuteronomy. There, there are some little added verses. And I'll read one of them. That, that's our verse. It goes like this. Remember, observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy, and it will be the same way. And then it says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? That's added there. You know what's taken out from Exodus 20? Exodus 20 will say, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Interesting, isn't it? That part's taken out, but the other part is added into Deuteronomy. Remember that you were slaves. I think it's because of this. I think it's because the Israelites didn't really know who God was when he called them out of, out of Egypt. And when he told them who he was, he needed to remind them or to tell them really for the first time, I'm the one who created everything. I hold the keys of life to everything. I am the creator, creator, your God. And in Deuteronomy, after, after wandering for 40 years, God needs to remind them, I'm just not the creator. I'm the liberator. I am the one who will set you free from your bondage of slavery. I am and the liberator God. I think that's an amazing thing, that we understand that God is creator, but that God is also the one who will free us from death and from sin and to take away the shackles. I think Deuteronomy is a reminder to that generation, you 
need to remember who you, you, your master is. Your master is one who's freed you. Your master is not the Pharaoh who would make you work seven days of the week, night and day, over and over and over and over again. I'm the God who has saved you. I'm the God who has liberated you. And I am the God who will give you rest and a Sabbath to enjoy. You see the difference? Shocking and radical that a God would give those that belong to him rest and health and joy to live. That's what he's called us to do. He's called us to enjoy him as creator. He's called us to enjoy him as liberator. And he has a God who is love and compassion to give us rest. Amen? Amen. Um, let's pray. And we're going to pray for a couple people. And you can pray on your own for, for others. But I want to pray for Josh Benninger. Josh's dad is in very dire straits. And so uh, we'll pray for him. Josh is in New Jersey watching over his dad. And uh, his dad had, had a very bad stroke and is not, in, is not doing very well. So we'll pray for him. And um, as I speak, let's see if I can pull this out. We will pray for the ladies in pink. Ruth Berg, Janet Daniels, Karen Vonderbergi, and Barbara Black. They are uh, getting ready to, uh, to finish up their hike on the Camino in Spain, and uh, they're at this beautiful church. And so let's pray for them. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'll have to ask her. Is it Madrid? Somewhere around there. Is it? We'll ask her. She, she can tell her story all, uh, when she gets back. But, Lord, we give you thanks. Uh, you are the creator and liberator, the one who gives us hope. We ask you to rest, rest your peace upon Josh Benninger and upon his father, Jim. We ask you for healing uh, in your will, in your way, Lord. And uh, we ask you to give him comfort, Lord. And we give thanks for those four ladies in pink uh, hiking the Camino that, Lord, you would make your presence known there, too, as they enjoy fellowship and fun, but also seek your will and to seek your presence. And for all of us, Lord, we lift up those things that, uh, that would uh, seek to, uh, to distract us or to dismay us. And we ask you, creator, liberator, giver of hope, to watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.